Hi there, I'm Mark Icero, and this is the Highlighter Podcast. Hello and welcome to the 23rd episode of the Highlighter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If this is your first time listening to the show, welcome. And if you're a longtime listener, welcome back and thank you. The Highlighter Podcast is an opportunity for us to talk about the best articles on race, education, and culture. And it's also a great way to meet and learn more about some wonderful people who are curious and doing some great work in the world. This week is no different. I'm very excited to let you know our guest on the show for this week. Her name's Jamie Morantz, and we are friends and former colleagues. Jamie is a wonderful, experienced educator in the Bay Area. She has worked in all levels of education. She is extremely smart and astute and also very wise with regard to what we need in order to improve our educational system. She's going to be talking about not just the article that NPR had in number 121 about Baloo High School in Washington, D.C., but she's also going to be talking about the Code Switch series of podcasts that came out about a month or two ago that so many of you want to talk about. Let's get right into that interview. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm doing pretty good getting over the usual cold that we all have. It is that time of year. Amen. Thank you so much for having me in your home. I'm super thrilled you're here. I'm so excited to be able to have you on the podcast. And for the folks out there who may not know you, please introduce yourself. My name is Jamie Morantz. I'm an educator. I work in Oakland, have for many, many years um, in the Bay Area. Wonderful. And how did you get into, why education for you? Wow, that's, uh, that's a really interesting story. So never in my life did I expect to be here. I actually struggled a lot in school. Uh, in second grade, I, they tried to say I was special because I had the apparently ADHD of all times. Back, I'm older, it was back in the day before people knew what that was and it just meant they wanted you to go away. Um, and then I didn't make it through high school and flunked out of that um, and became a musician and an engineer and did a bunch of other things. And then had an epiphany because of a health issue in my life and I had to decide do I want to do something that like makes the world better and leaves leaves the world better and makes reasonable excuse for my existence or just continue to do things I thought were fun and I decided nope I really wanted to do something to sort of help make it better if I could so I ended up in education in the very roundabout way Mm -hmm. And you've been a teacher, you've been a principal, you've been all over the educational spectrum. Indeed. And I guess the question is sort of like, what is your tack or theory of action when you see a classroom or a school? What are you looking for? That's a really interesting question. Um, First, I just try and see what I see, um, which in and of itself is hard enough because we all have internal filters for what we're looking for. So I try and see what I see and I always invariably am looking at it through the lens of what are the students doing? Um, How are they leaning in? How are they engaged? What's the level of sort of cognitive engagement for them? Are they thinking? Are they arguing? Are they making meaning? Um, And is the classroom relaxed and are students actually feeling safe enough to share and to be engaged in that way. So I start there and then all kinds of other things come um, to my attention. That's right. And then do you feel like your own educational background has framed or influenced how you are now as an educator? Oh, definitely. Uh, Sitting and listening is like the worst, like it's a punishment. I feel like if I go to hell, it will be like that. I'll be stuck in a classroom somewhere where someone's talking at me all day. Um, I'm not good with that. I constantly have questions popping into my mind and I want to ask them. Um, I, or I get completely bored because I can't and then I'm completely distracted. So just my style of learning and I, and also the style of what I think most people learn 
like, I read a really interesting article about this, 75% of people are what they call talk processors. Like you actually, if you think about the role of evolution in talking and communicating, it was to get, to understand, to learn, and to learn together. Like, oh, I see that, oh, I see that, whoa, we should pay attention to that. And when kids can't talk to each other, when people don't get to process, their brains don't actually do very well, right? And so for me, like, that's the deal is how do you teach through questioning so that the people in the room are grappling with those questions and they're working together to try and figure them out. That's the kind of room and that's the kind of learning that works for many, many students. Unfortunately, the stu students who love sitting and listening tend to become teachers because it worked for them. And then they don't understand why these people in front of them are completely squirrely and like bored and are not engaged yeah. because it worked for them. It didn't yeah. work for me. Yeah, totally. I'm happy you raised that. I mean, so the audience may not know that we got to work together. It was so much fun. And we were, you know, pretty, we're a good team together because I, I do enjoy the, the listening and <laughs> And maybe not necessarily talking. And so it was just funny because we were very complimentary. Um, but I do agree with you. Like, school did work for me. You know, I made it work. Mm -hmm. And and yes, I think that I did a pretty good job of maybe teaching for different styles. But I didn't have that fundamental experience of true sort of struggle or frustration or anger even mm -hmm. that maybe a lot of our students are having and perhaps maybe you had um, even as early as elementary through mm -hmm. through high school. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I want to ask you, though, like when you are working with folks who are teachers who don't truly get it, how doesn't that make you a little bit... Fr like, how do you communicate with folks, your colleagues when they just want things to be a certain way? Um, that's a really great question. One of the things that I've learned over many years is, first of all, I feel like I was lucky because I taught science. And for me, I can't understand how you can learn science any other way than by doing it, right? Um, though I see lots of people, I've seen people teaching science from a book and it like, uh, makes my pants on fire. Um, I'm like, wait, no, wait, what are you doing? Ask the questions. It's so fun. Um, so what do I do? So what I do is I work with teachers and I often am doing professional development or coaching and things like that. And so I often arrange the learning experience so that it is not me standing and talking. And then I try and be very metacognitive with people about how was that helpful and why was that helpful. And again, I find that if you show people the what and the why behind why that works and how your brains work, because I think educators don't often learn anything about brain science, really, or what works in learning, that then they're like, oh, and they realize, yeah, actually, that was way more engaging and I enjoyed that more and let me see if I can do that for my kids better. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that's how I do it. But it is very, um, I don't know, frustrating. It's uh, because I see it as a puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I like puzzles. Yeah. Yeah. Are you ready to get going on one of the articles? Let's do it. So what's great is that you said that you wanted to talk about two things in conversation with each other. So the Ron Brown Code Switch series of podcasts mm -hmm. that have been going on for the last month or so, um, in conversation with the article a couple weeks ago in number 121 about Baloo High School. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Yep. And you found that there were some similarities with what was going on. By the way, audience, if you have not uh, listened to, it actually became four parts. It yeah. was a three-part series that Code Switch did, and then they had sort of like a reflection where they talked about it. They, they brought the writer and the reporters in. So that's one thing. Definitely listen to that. And if you haven't read the story that NPR did on Baloo High School, I definitely encourage that. Um, why did you choose both of these together? Well, they both are so at the heart of, of everything that I've been doing for so long. And the things, they echo some of the same things that I see and have struggled with in my own career, even right now. Um, this idea that you know the system's not working for some students, many students actually, if you look at the statistics about dropouts and all that. Um, and so it just really lit up a lot of things for me. 
I think is how I would say that. Um, I also see a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people in my career trying to fix, trying to fix this problem, right, in all these different ways. And there was something really heartbreaking to me about the Ron Brown article in particular. Uh, the blue one wasn't really heartbreaking. It was more like, didn't really surprise me that much, actually. Mm -hmm. So on the Ron Brown, so both of these schools are in Washington, D.C., and they serve predominantly, if not almost all, African-American students. And Ron Brown is this new high school that was trying to work with and is trying to work with African-American boys. Yep. And so in the story, they are fiercely trying to change the script of... I would say failure, but also sort of compliance, I would say, with this idea that love will always, is the only solution, really. And what's interesting is that a lot of the East Coast approaches, I have always felt that people in Oakland and San Francisco would not necessarily connect with. But here's Ron Brown, that they have a whole team of folks saying, you belong here, we love you, and we have to we have to get there in a different way. Right. We're going to hold on to you no matter what. Yeah. And yet, it seems like they had a lot of turmoil and trauma. And what do you think, why do you think that happened? Oh, that is, that's exactly why this thing was so important to me. So why? I think that what I've seen here as well as in other situations is you have a group of people who come together who have the same overall goal to, to serve a certain population that hasn't been being served well. And they often have a fervor that they are all there. And yet, do we ever really know if we believe that the road to that end is the same? So in a room, it's like that story about the seven blind men and the elephant. We all think we know what the elephant is, um, and yet, once we start to go down the road together, we start to realize, wait a minute, what you think is best for kids isn't necessarily the path or the things that I would have kids do. And you saw in that podcast the, um, I wouldn't say clash exactly, but it was a clash of ideologies where the teachers that came there with like, yes, I have always wanted to do this. I'm going to get these African-American boys academically ready to be successful in college career, their choice, whatever they want to do. And the sort of social emotional um, folks, the social workers and the emotional support providers who, again, were all about, no, we need all this time to change their social emotional uh, perspective or something, right? However you want to put that. And the com competition for limited time, limited resources was really hard for both sides. Um, and the teachers really felt like they needed more time with the students academically, which I, they were right. The kids were not at grade level. Yeah. How would and you yet, feel about a math uh, class that only met once or twice a week? Oh my God. That made my head like spin around like in the exorcist. I was like, oh, you have kids who are at second. I know because I had kids in middle schools and high schools that I've worked with at second and third grade levels who can't add double digit numbers. Um, and that is something that you can address, but you can't do it in two hours a week. Right. So I think that that's what I mean. Like what was the vehicle for getting there? And once they're all on the bus together and you suddenly realize, wait, I thought we were going to Des Moines and no, I, I thought we were going to St. Louis. Like, and then you got everybody like, I want to get off this bus and that, I think, is what you see in the 50% turnover at the end of that year. And partly, probably, too, it is really exhausting totally. to work with students who are very far behind, and not just very far behind academically, but don't necessarily have um, the sort of executive functioning skills, the organizational skills, the habit of getting up every day, of bringing your things, of remembering um, to that situation. So... I would have loved to have heard more from the teachers that left. Obviously, they um, sort of uh, highlight this one algebra teacher who really is very against some of the policies that the district actually brought down on them that wasn't even theirs, which is a whole other thing that I, I saw in that that I'm like, wow, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. Policy decisions made that then somehow don't get explained but get 
sort of trickle down, and then the people who have to enforce them are like, what the heck is this? I'm not doing this. I think that's a great point, because here you have a whole group of educators basically founding the school and saying, hey, we are going to get there. Mm -hmm. Then it did become clear in one of the podcasts that the how or the road, as Mm -hmm. you say, was a little bit different internally. Mm -hmm. And so they were trying to make it work, you know, you're trying, because there's only one day when you, there's only a certain number of hours in the day. And so therefore, when you go to a college, you can't have math class. And so there's always going to be that internal sort of fighting. But then it is true, like what happened is that the district sort of made this policy around what does passing mean. And then it seemed like the, the educators just didn't have enough of a cohesive whole. It was like or- the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. There was already sort of internal strife about I need more kids more and, you know, how do I get them to pass? And then this policy that basically said, hey, you know, it's okay as long as you pass one quarter, you can pass a year. Mm -hmm. And I think that just threw some people all the way into the deep end, which I can understand. Um, Because again, I understand on some level, I think, why you would make a policy like that. But that policy only works if you're doing what I call mastery-based sort of grading. So in other words, if I don't get it, I don't get it, I don't get it, and I finally get it, well, yes, I should pass. Mm -hmm. If I actually finally get it, it, whatever the big quintessential thing I need to know to go on to the next level. But I'm not sure that that's how the policy felt to people, or was certainly didn't seem that they understood it that way, or it wasn't really explained that way, since no one seemed to be grading in that way anyway, which is a struggle in and of itself. It is interesting, too, though, the parallels that the Ron Brown podcast had with the Baloo, both Washington, D.C., both having to do with whom they're serving versus how they're getting there. And in my blurb, I purposely wrote some of the specifics from the Baloo policies just to sort of get a little bit of consternation a little bit. For example, at Baloo, 50 percent for not turning something in Mm -hmm. and then also at Baloo being able to be absent from a class for months and still pass. And then one more at Baloo, everybody getting into college, but nobody actually going. So we're supposed to be mad, right? Right. Educators and all, I mean, it's so funny because educators we sort of know, Mm -hmm. but then imagine what like the general public thinks about these crazy policies. And then I would feel though that you might have a different view. So... I do believe that students should have a certain level of actual ability to sort of go on. So, for example, if I sent a soldier to boot camp and all they ever did was drill with brooms and they only did it for half an hour a day um, and then we sent them to war with guns they really didn't even know how to use and people who did on the other side, I would think, wow, that's really irresponsible of you. What makes you think that's actually a good idea? It's kind of, I think, what happened to our soldiers in World War I, actually. Um, that's not really helpful because the truth is the college is what it is. And that, talk about something that's like in cement. Um, and as long as that's the holy grail of getting them through college, if that's the answer, then you have to actually give them the ability to, to succeed there. Now, the question is, what is that? Where is that bar? Is it simply that I can read and write well enough that when you give me something I don't know, I can make meaning from it? Is it that I can say, I don't really need to know trigonometry or calculus because I'm really into history and social justice and I'm not going to take that stuff anyway? Like, where is the what anyway is a big, it's actually a really big question in my mind, but I think that students who can't read or write very well to make meaning and don't have the ability to sit and know that if I struggle with this thing in front of me, I will eventually figure it out and get there, are probably not going to be successful in college. And if you look at the dropout numbers, well, something's going on there, right? Because as we know, um, it's very low, and it's even lower for kids that come from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds, in quotes, or students who are less prepared academically. So what is the goal, and then how do you really attack it? So... Then that brings me back to the grading thing. So why are we even talking about a 50% for something you don't turn in? Well, I want us to take a step back. The problem is the grading scale. 
Anybody who understands the grading scale would understand why it's a problem. When you have 100 points and an F is 0, that means 0 to 50. Half of that scale is failing, and only half of the scale is passing. So if you give me a 50, I'm still failing, but I actually am close enough, if you start adding these things up, that if I actually did work later on to show you that I understood stuff, I could pass a class. If you give people zeros because of the huge gap between 0 and 50, think of that compared to 50 and 60. You have 10 points between grades, and yet here I have 50, actually 60 points, before I start passing. So there's, there's something wrong with that scale if we're not just trying to punish people for not being compliant and turning work in, which is a whole other story. Is it compliance or is it learning? Right. It is really crazy to me that no matter how much attempt there is toward reform, <laughs> the grading scale, I mean, I feel like my entire career, I've been like trying to, trying to explain. Fix grading. Yeah, and it's just, it's just really hard. It's really hard. Like, so yes, yeah, so if we, a lot of people have said, this isn't good. What I really want to know about a student is, do they, did they get it? So, for example, you get a D, and then you get a C, and then you're like, you have an epiphany, and on the final you get an A. Well, shouldn't you get an A in the class? Yeah. I learned it all, but no, no, I'm going to average all that stuff together, and you're going to end up maybe with a C+. Plus. Yeah. Well, as a student, you're like, well, pff, what's, there's that. Is it grade for motivation? Is it to express your understanding? And then how do you really express that well? So then people have said, well, let's mastery-based grade, which is you get two or three attempts at something, and it's the final attempt that shows your actual level of mastery, which is a great concept, but again, takes an enormous amount of work. And remember, who are teachers? Teachers are people who spent 18 years of their lives, six hours a day in school, being trained while they were students in what school is and how it works. And now I want you to go into school and do something completely different that you've never seen and don't understand at all. And by the way, we really didn't train you to do. Well, and even the profession of teaching is about meeting 4 billion deadlines every day. Yeah. So if being in school as a high school student is making sure you know, the only way that your grade actually changes on a 100 point scale after week three <laughs> is if you don't turn an assignment because of that huge penalty. Exactly. If you really want to go up, there's only those 30 points that you can maybe go up. But if you all of a sudden don't turn something, then that's actually when your grade goes down. Exactly. But I think that that's also, I mean, I remember when I was a teacher, there were so many deadlines yes. every single day. Mm -hmm. And so even, it's very, it was very hard to create sort of an, an, an expansive, because you have 30 kids in the room and there's a lot of movement. Oh, 30 times 5 or 6 if you're in, act, it's 150 kids a day. Right. So it does sound better. You know, you've got to get them in line. They better do the compliance thing. And then all of a sudden you're maybe not focusing as much on the learning or about transformation. Right. And that's the thing that I think both of these pieces brought out is... Is it actually really possible to have change in a system for students who have not been served by doing the same thing over and over again? Amen. I would say that's the biggest problem. And that's why when you look around the country at different charter schools, even what Ron Brown's trying to do, people are scratching their heads going, so what would work? And the truth is, there's no magic, like, you know, there's no Wizard of Oz with the magic thing that's going to tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. So these experiments that, you know, like, I'm, I'm super excited that Ron Brown's trying to do what they're going to do. And I don't think they're going to give up. And I think eventually they're going to find, you know, how to express exactly what they think their theory of action is more clearly. So people who get on that bus want to be in there and you fix some of the difficulties that you're having, that's great. Because that's what you see. That's what the whole charter thing really is about, right, is scratching our heads at what does work. Because changing a district is as hard, a large district, many, many schools. I mean, look what happened when D.C. came without that policy, blew up that whole school, mm -hmm. right? So when you're far away from the actual action, it's, it becomes even more problematic. So you have lots of people trying lots of different things. Is it... Is it um, we need to do projects. Is it that students need mastery-based grading? Is it that they need internships and real experience in the world? There are so many different flavors. And the truth is, I would say, somewhere buried in here is that we're all different. 
And different things actually resonate better or worse with different people. So the idea that school maybe should be different for different people isn't such a crazy idea. But different does not mean, in my mind, unequal. And that, and in terms of outcomes. And that's where the rubber really hits the road in my mind. If everyone could just decide on what the heck are the actual outcomes, then I'd be like, okay, can you get there? How do, how do you think is the best way to get there? Well, that's the other thing, too, is that we don't like when students don't come to class. And yet, if they're not necessarily getting very much from the class, or if they can already reach the outcomes before or in the middle of doing that class, we have to ask, like, is it just, again, seat time? Right. And or is compliance. It, right, exactly. See, the thing that gets me really scared about these pieces, though, is how folks are entering in, and I want to have as much trust about the general population as, as possible, and yet the thing that we haven't necessarily spot on talked about yet is this element of race here as well. Mm -hmm. So the typical NPR listener, for example, is you know an educated liberal white person. And so or I maybe get, at least middle class. Right. And so my thing is there is like this judgment out there about what Washington, D.C., for us, totally across the country, mm -hmm. should be doing, you know, with African-American kids. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, there's like a possible judgment, not just about like what was successful for me as a high school, but sort of like that the entire country gets to decide what a specific district does. Does that play into any of your analysis? Well, I think it kind of goes back again to this idea that every community is different, and yet everybody wants the same thing for their kids. Like right now I'm working in a um, uh, very he heavily, I would say, probably 70 to 80% Latino population, but those parents want the same things for their kids that the kids out in Dublin and wherever else or African-American neighborhoods want. They want their kids to have a better life than they did, to have more opportunities and more options. That's sort of the bottom line. No one says, I send my kid to school, you know, to do nothing. So I think that that is true. And yet I think that the needs of my students right now are different. I have more English learner students. So how do I have enough autonomy and yet at the same time who's watching to make sure that I'm actually educating those kids and I think that's the whole like when I could go into this whole thing too like when you take parents out of school who understand how to advocate for their students and understand the system well enough um, to realize when something's going awry then you sort of take the canaries out of the coal mine and I think that's what you see in a lot of urban districts like even in DC they're saying they have these black high schools, basically, and the white high schools. Um, and they mask it through choice or whatever, but we've gone against the whole Board of Education, and I think that's a big issue. There's no doubt, and there was a great line in the, um, I think it was the Ron Brown one, about how when kids go to diverse schools, socioeconomically diverse schools, because I think actually this is where the pedal hits the metal, in my experience, um, all kids do better. So back in the day, I took over the school's principal, and at the time, it was low income, it was horrible achievement, it had collected a lot of um, teachers and staff from the district who knew they didn't have to work very hard, there wasn't a lot of oversight, no one was really paying attention, and there were very few middle class people in that school, even though it sat right at the edge of a very middle class neighborhood, uh, right across the big street there. And I was like, wow, this is a problem. And so one of the things I wanted to do was to try and actually build in the ability for us to have a more integrated population socioeconomically. And I was actually very lucky that there was an elementary school in the area and those, those parents were sort of hoping to be able to come to their school. And together, we started a change. So we went from like 2% uh, white, for example, to about 12 or 13 percent white in five years. And we went from, I don't know what it was in the beginning, it's close to 80 percent free reduced lunch, to more like 65 percent. Mm -hmm. So it never was a white rich school, but that change, that having models in the classroom, having a, a mixture of kids to learn and enrich each other in real ways, 
was very powerful. And when you take those kids out of schools, you really, and their parents, and all the associated like fundraising and things like that that those parents were able to do, and pressure on the district about hideous, ugly facilities and things that are often really difficult for folks who are working way more than most middle class people are working two jobs or three jobs um, and don't have the language and all that, you strip the actual client's ability to influence the quality of the of the what they get from these service providers because that's really what we are the students and parents are the clients and we're supposed to serve them jamie one last question for you which is when so that was a great story of of a huge amount of improvement at oh, yeah. school level mm-hmm. but in general like a lot of times especially now it does feel really hard Mm-hmm. meaning the struggle is real and mm-hmm. especially like any efforts toward desegregation are very difficult. And yes. even if you're a teacher in the class, let's say that you're a teacher who's about 25 or 26 mm-hmm. and you really deeply believe in education. And yet maybe now because it's December, you're just feeling like it's too big. Oh, like, mm-hmm. no, but like my, yeah, like yeah. my question is how, how, how do you stay in? especially as you've seen lots of different things. Well, it's people who have never taught really don't get it. I Not only have I taught, but I was a musician, and I did gigs, right? And you have to think of school like this. The gig starts at 8.30 and doesn't end till 3.15. You get a 30-minute break and maybe one sort of prep and maybe a three- to five-minute passing period. You have, if you're a secondary teacher, five to seven shows a day. The bell rings and they come. Whether That's the hardest gig I've ever done. And I've done gigs where I drove, you know, went from uh, like the Ramada Inns and did five sets a night, right? But I had a 15-minute break every 45 minutes and no one bothering me, um, which our teachers don't even get that. And you're on. You're on whether you're ready or not. And the kids are there 20, 30, 40, depending on how many you have, all of their little emotional needs are in your face and you, you are, you have no choice. You don't get to sit at a desk and go, you know, right now I don't feel like answering the phone. You have no ability to emotionally stop at any point in the day and act like I'm not dealing with you right now. The emotional, psychic, and sort of physical work that being a teacher is, is really unimaginable unless you do it. It's just like being a principal. Uh, That's a whole other different kind of thing. But it's all really hard and takes a ton of time. And we don't give teachers the time to do what they need to do in their day to really prepare for students. And when you look around the world at places that have done much better with diverse kids and diverse situations or even non-diverse situations, you see they teach less, they prep more, they're often paid better, and they're respected which we don't even respect teachers here. When you go to a cocktail party and tell them your teacher, you're like, oh, oh. like you're some St. Teresa, thank God for you, because uh, it's just ridiculous. The whole thing is ridiculous. I don't know if I actually answered your question. You did. Okay, thank and you. And Jamie, thank you so much. This was wonderful. <laughs> oh, I had a great time, Mark. I could, as you can tell, talk about this forever, because it is. It's the, it's the conundrum wrapped in an enigma, shrouded in mystery, right? How do you fix this? this thing that we tr- want to fix and yet all this history we have this is how it's supposed to be this is what you're supposed to do we can't really let go of it's a real it's 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 a living tragedy and yet i never lose faith because i see it one one child one student one human being at a time that's how you stay in it I'd like to thank Jamie Morantz yet again for being on the show. As it became pretty much abundantly clear there, Jamie is entirely awesome. So thank you again. Listeners, if you have feedback, if you love the show, if you have some ideas, please email me at mark at highlighter.cc. Also, I think there's 10 five-star reviews over on Apple Podcasts. So if you want to add yours, please do. I'd like to thank you again for listening, and please be aware that there's going to be another newsletter this Thursday at 9.10, especially if you subscribe. If you don't subscribe, it's highlighter.cc slash subscribe. Have a great week.